Can we go to Hebrews 1? Yes. 1, let's look at 1 and 2? Yep. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. I mean, the way I read this, it's telling me that Yahweh did not speak through his Son in Old Testament times. Yeah, I know. Many people read it that way. Yeah. You don't read it that way? No, because in the same book of Hebrews, he shows the Son and the Spirit speaking on behalf of the Father in the Old Testament. Let me show you. Go to Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2, the very next chapter. Hebrews 2. Let's read verses 9 to 13. According to the author of Hebrews, the Son spoke through the psalmist, and not only the Son, but the Holy Spirit. So when the text says, God the Father spoke in various ways, some of the ways that he spoke was through the Son and the Spirit. But now he exclusively speaks by the Son. That's what the text says. But lest you think I'm reading too much into it, Hebrews 2, verses 9 to 13. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. According to Hebrews, Psalm 22, 22, which he just quoted, and Isaiah 8, 7, 18, are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ speaking through the prophets as his mouthpiece. And Jesus came to fulfill them. He just quoted Psalm 22, 22, and Isaiah 8, 17, 18, and Hebrews saying, it was the son who used the mouth of David and Isaiah to speak through them about what he would come to do when he became flesh. So whatever Hebrews 1 means, it cannot contradict the very next chapter where the very author says, one of the means by which the Father spoke was by means of his Son and the Holy Spirit. If you want to show where the Holy Spirit speaks, I can. Let me give you another example where the Son speaks in the Old Testament. Hebrews wait, 10. Wait, wait, just a second. I don't see the Son speaking here. I mean, I see these are the words of the Son. Yes. But it's to me, it's the prophet speaking prophetically about what the Son will the say son, right not the son yeah, speaking yeah. to the prophet no it's the son speaking through the prophet not to the prophet because the author doesn't say it's the words of the prophets he says it's the words of the son he didn't say it's the prophet speaking about the son he's saying no the son is speaking that's why he's not ashamed to call them brothers saying it's the son speaking and another example is hebrews 10 verses 5 to 9. consequently when christ came into the world he said sacrifices and offerings you have not desired but a body you have prepared for me in burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure then i said behold i have come to do your will O god as it is written of me in the scroll of the book but when he said above you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings these are offered according to the law then he added behold i have come to do your will he does away with the first in order to establish the second. So according to Hebrews, it was Jesus that spoke Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. He spoke those words, announcing the incarnation that he'd come into the world to become flesh, assuming the body that God prepared for him, which you deny, by the way. You don't believe he was there before he took on a body. But Psalm 40 says, yes, the son is speaking, announcing to the Old Testament, I will come into that body to offer myself for your salvation. It doesn't say, I will come into the body. It says, well, I have again. come. Well, read it one more time. A body you have prepared for me, and I have come to do your will, O God. Let's read it again. Because it says in verse 5, when Christ came into the world. So before he came into the world, he's announcing that he's coming into the world to take the body prepared for him to do God's will. Yeah, it's right there. Five to nine. But it says he came... It says, when Christ came into the world. The world and not finished. before he came into the world. Well, but do you, that means... He was there before he came into the world, and then he came into the world. So you're still making my point. When he came into the world. So that means at one point, he was not in the world, but came into it. And then let's read carefully the language. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, 
Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. So he came into the world to do the will of God, which was to assume that body prepared so he can offer himself as a sacrifice. So Jesus is speaking in the Old Testament. He's speaking Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. I got another right, one if you I want. Don't see at this point in time. Say it again. I don't see that in this at this point in time. Well, First Corinthians ten agrees that Jesus was the rock that led Israel and fed them. First Corinthians ten verses one of four. So you may not agree with it. This is why I keep saying, you have now clung to a particular belief that no matter what passage is shown, you can't accept it at face value. You want to explain it to agree with what you've come to believe. But we need to be open to the Spirit to show us maybe what we believe is wrong. And let's change our theology to read Scripture, because it's not just Hebrews 10 that says Jesus was there speaking. Let me show you a cross-reference with Hebrews 11 and 1 Corinthians 10. If you can go to Hebrews 11, 24 to 27. And I'm going to cross-reference it with 1 Corinthians 10 to show this is the interpretation of these passages, and I'm not making it up. And Hebrews 11, 24 to 27. Why did Moses give up everything? All the riches of Egypt gave up his status. Why did he do it? Notice what the author says. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So I want you to note two points here, and the English may not be as clear. It says, he considered suffering reproach for Christ, meaning suffering shame for the sake of Christ, better than the riches of Egypt, because he saw the one who's invisible. In other words, and there are paraphrases of this, it'll tell you, that he considered the loss of everything being <clears throat> worth the loss in order to suffer for the sake of Christ because he saw the one who's invisible. It's right there, reproach of Christ. It didn't say reproach of God the Father. He didn't suffer reproach because of his love for devotion to God the Father. He suffered reproach, humiliation, because of Christ, his love for and faith in Christ because he saw the one who's invisible. But according to you, Jesus was never there. Invisible or visible. So he didn't give up everything for the sake of Christ. Paul says, or whoever wrote it, that's exactly what he did, which then goes with the other passage that confirms my interpretation. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 of 4. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. You don't believe this literally. J Paul said there's a spiritual rock, and that goes to Deuteronomy 32, where he always said to be the rock that fed them. And that spiritual rock that followed them in the cloud at the time of Moses that fed them was Christ, which you don't accept. You don't believe that. Correct. I don't believe that. Exactly. So it seems our it's theology... Spiritual. Well, of course, because Jesus is not a rock mass. That's his point. But in Deuteronomy 32, we're told that spiritual rock is Yahweh, not a creature. But then Paul says, well, that spiritual rock who's Yahweh is Christ. That's exactly the point. He's not a rock mass. He's a spiritual rock, but that spiritual rock was actually there nourishing them. But in Deuteronomy 32, 4 and 15 and 20, we're told it's Yahweh, the rock who fed Jeshurun. But here he says Christ was that spiritual rock that fed them. Which you don't believe. So no matter what I quote to show that Jesus is there speaking and active, you're going to say, well, it doesn't mean that. See, this is the problem. This, this goes back. This is a reference to when Moses struck the rock, right? No. It's reference to Deuteronomy 32, where Yahweh the rock fed Jeshurun and they rebelled against him. We can look at Deuteronomy 32 to see what rock was there feeding Israel and nourishing Israel, because that's the context of 1 Corinthians 10. Because he even connects the worship of demons, mentioned Deuteronomy 32 here in 1 Corinthians 10. But if you want to show him, Scott, go to Deuteronomy 32, read verses 4 to 7, to see who the rock was. 
The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. They have dealt corruptly with him, they are no longer his children because they are blemished, they are a crooked and twisted generation. <laughs> Do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you your elders and they will tell you. Now read 15 to 20 to see what this rock Yahweh did for them. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, stout and sleek. Then he forsook God who made him and scoffed at the rock of his salvation. They stirred him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded. You were unmindful of the rock that bore you, and you forgot the God who gave you birth. The Lord saw it and spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation children in whom is no faithfulness according to paul this spiritual rock yahweh because he's not a rock mass who fed them nourished them whom they rebelled and he punished was christ <laughs> just because they both bear the title of the rock no it's not that in the context he said moses in the cloud and the israelites had a rock following them and feeding them that's the context not just the rock remember the context first corinthians 10 verses 1 to 4 that they were all baptized in Moses and in the cloud and crossed the sea. And there was a rock that followed them, that fed them spiritually. And that rock, that's the connection. Let's reread it again. First Corinthians 10 verses 1 to 4. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was christ that's the connection not simply he's called rock and god is called rock he's called the spiritual rock who was there feeding preserving and punishing israel at the time of moses that's the connection i'm trying to remember what i believe about this <laughs> that's all right it says if they drank from the spiritual rock Yep. Okay, so when Moses struck the rock and water came out. No, it's not just water. It says they ate the spiritual food. You keep focusing on water. Right, but that would be matter. Yeah. Be so all of that came from the rock that followed them. You keep trying to limit it to the rock he struck. No, it says the food they ate, the water they drank, or whatever they drank, came from the spiritual rock who followed them. That rock mass right. that he struck did not follow them. And he says that spiritual rock is Christ. If I recall correctly, is the word them is not in the Greek, is it? it uh, we can look it up, but that would still be irrelevant when it says, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed. Followed what? Followed in time, not followed them directly. Where do you get in time when the context is that Israel was being preserved and fed by this rock that was there? See, this is again what you're doing. You have to explain it to agree with your tradition. That's exactly my point. But we can look at the Greek and see if it's the plural is there. But it doesn't change the meaning. Moses and that rock were there. And the cloud that followed them is equated with the spiritual rock that was following them because it was the cloud that followed them. And that was the source of their sustenance. So it's not just the rock he hit. That didn't follow anyone. It's the food they ate, the drink they drank all from that spiritual rock and he says that spiritual rock wasn't the father per se but the son christ now let me you have the greek text in front of you brother or should i get it up uh, i can get it uh, i can get it yeah if you get it before me go ahead all right hold on one second let me get there yeah because if you go to verse four ik pneumatikes akulu thuses patres that's rock e patra de and o Christos. Yeah, the word for them is not in the Greek, but it's implied because it says accompanying. Accompanying who? Moses and the Israelites. But there, let me get you another link. Just so you can see it for yourself in transliteration. Which word says accompany? Uh, let me, hold on one second. Oh, my bad. Let me show you. The word accompanying is the word akolu 
Thusis, Akolu Thusis, accompanying, the spiritual accompanying rock, literally. Pneumatikes, Akolu Thusis, Patres. But anyway, that, relevant to the point, but let me show you. Where's the comment so I can give you the link? You can now go here and see the Greek in transliteration. But whatever it is, the spiritual rock that fed the Israelites, Don Moses, is said to be the cross, the Christ. So we're still now, we have Hebrews 11 agreeing. Moses gave up everything for Christ because he saw the one who's invisible. Confirmed by Paul that Christ was there with Moses, accompanying him and the Israelites and feeding them. So this is the consistent teaching of scripture. And by the way, I didn't ask. I thought you follow the King James. Is there one particular version that you follow? No. Okay. Well, that's the thing. See, this is one thing. That means, yeah, what happens usually, and this is true of all of us, we will look at a variety of Bible versions and human tendency being what it is, and I'm guilty of it. I'm not saying you, all of us. We will cling to that one particular version that supports what we believe. I say that because there's another text that says that Jesus was there. In some versions, it's much clearer because it's based on earlier Greek manuscripts where the reading has Jesus, but even in the majority text where the word is Lord, clearly in the context, that Lord is Jesus. What I'm referring to is Jude 1, verses 4 to 5. Brother, if you can look at the ESV, Jude 1, verses 4 to 5. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Some of our earliest Greek copies of Jude had the word, have the word Jesus. In fact, the oldest extent copy of Jude actually re reads the God Christ. It actually says the God Christ. That's the earliest copy we have of Jude. It says, and it was the God Christ. God, who is Christ, Christ, who is God. And some of our earlier versions have Jesus. Now, the majority of witnesses have Lord. But even if we go with Lord, in the context, you're already told who that Lord is. Our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So even if I go with the reading Lord, let me, let me go with the reading Lord. Let me read it. And deny our only master and Lord, only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus Let's go with Lord. Now, I want you to remind you that, although you once fully knew it, that the Lord who saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Even if I go with the reading Lord, in the context, you're told who that Lord is, our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. You still end up with Jesus being the one who brought them out of Egypt and punished them in the desert. Now, if I go with the earlier Greek copies of Jude, it actually says Jesus. And the earliest copy of Jude says, the God Christ saved them and punished them. The God who is Christ, Christ who is God. Now, but you still won't accept the evidence. You're still going to say, no, it wasn't Jesus. See my point? Even if I show you it's Jesus who was there, you're going to say, no, it doesn't mean that. So if I show you 1 Corinthians 10, it doesn't mean Jesus was there. If I show you Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews 11, it doesn't mean Jesus was there speaking through the prophets or with Moses. If I show you Jude in the context, it doesn't mean Jesus was actually there saving Israel. So no amount of evidence will convince you unless you open your heart to what the Holy Spirit is showing you from Scripture. Okay, do I have access to this meeting later? Yes, the yes it'll it. be on YouTube, so anyone can watch the recording of the replay of yes. the live stream. Yeah. We'll send you the link, John. Yeah, it's on again. Take it. Now, I know maybe you're pressed on time. If you have a question, because I wanted to ask you one final question from my end, if that's okay. That's up to you. Go ahead. All right. Let's go to Revelation 21, verses 6 to 7. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. I, th I don't think you would argue with me or doubt that this is God Almighty. I'm not saying the Son. Let's say the Father. God Almighty, because only God Almighty can be the Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, of first and last, right? Or Alpha and Omega, and the beginning and the end. I don't think you would disagree with me, right? Because it says, I will be his God, he'll be my son. 
I think I think the son and the father can be the beginning and end, first and last, in their own way. Uh, but how many ways can you be the beginning and the end when beginning means he was there at the start, and the end means he'll be there with the last generation because he's timeless and the creator of all things. You can't have a creature that's at the beginning and will be at the end because the beginning means I was there at the start with the first generation, and I will continue to reign with the very last, the end of all generations, at the consummation of the age. Because that's how Isaiah 41, 4 interprets it. Okay, so, so let's just say this is the Father. Yes, yeah, so, so yeah. because only the Father can be almighty, beginningless, uncreated, according to you, only the Father. If Jesus is a creature, he can't be the beginning and the end because he was created. So he wasn't there at the start of creation, right? <clears throat> you could say now that he lives immortally, he'll be there till the end. And I say that because now I want you to see something our Lord says in John 5, 22 to connect it with Revelation. In John 5, 22... The Lord clearly says he's coming to judge. The father judges no one. The father will judge no one. He has appointed the son to come to do all the judging. So any passage that talks about judgment to come, that's the son who's going to do it. Because we don't believe the Bible contradicts. Because in John 5, 22, what does it say? For the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son. So that all may we don't need to read 23 because the focus is he judges absolutely no one. All judgment has been entrusted to the son he's the one who does all the judging and that's confirmed in matthew 16 27 if you can show it to him because i'm trying to make a connection where clearly it's jesus and we can't deny jesus because the lord jesus said my father doesn't judge anyone he will send me to do all the judging i'll do all the judging because in matthew 16 27 the lord speaking for the son of man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his father and then he will repay each person according to what he has done so this is the Son of Man, who's the Son of God, because he says the Son of Man is coming, glory of his Father with his angels, and he will recompense, repay, reward everyone according to his done. So clearly, you and I both believe the Bible doesn't contradict. Jesus comes to do all judging. The Father does not come. Now, why do I keep hammering it? Because I want to go to Revelation 22, 12. Open up the entire chapter if you can, brother. Revelation 22, 12. If John, who wrote the Gospel of John and Revelation, is consistent with himself, and consistent with the rest of Scripture, then there can't be a contradiction. Revelation 22, 12, what does the one coming say he will do when he arrives? Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. There is no way around the fact that's Jesus, because we just read John 5, 22, the Father judges no one, I do all the judging, the Son, and the Son of Man, will come in the glory of his Father with his angels to repay people according to the, what they've done. This is Jesus saying, Behold, I'm coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for, for what he's done. But now notice what he says in 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Impossible if he's a creature. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last, the beginning and the end. Something that only God Almighty can say, because this means he was there before creation, remains with creation, to the end of the age, because unlike creation, he transcends time, space, and place. Impossible if Jesus is a creature. Cannot say that. And there's no denying it's Jesus, because Jesus said, the Father judges no one. I, the Son, come to do all the judging. I'm the Son of Man, who will reward everyone according to what they've earned. When I come in the glory of my Father and my angels. And just in case we don't see it, Jesus, just in case we still miss it, brother, do me a favor, and we'll wrap up my question. Revelation 22, 12 and 13 with verse 20. So read 12 and 13 and jump to 20. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And get around it. It's Jesus the one saying, I am coming. I'll repay everyone according to the deeds, and I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first, last, the beginning, and the end. As a Trinitarian, I say amen. But for you who don't believe Jesus is eternal, but a human creature who is a plan in God's mind, how do you amen this? It's the same titles used of the only true God. Oh, I believe that they can have co titles in common. That doesn't make them the same person, though. No, I don't believe Jesus is the person of the Father. That's why I'm a Trinitarian. They're not the same person. But these titles they share in common can only be applicable to both if both the Father, Jesus, the Son, and Spirit are eternal, uncreated, beginningless, which is why we're Trinitarians. For example, the Son could be the first and the last being to ever be directly begotten by the Father. 
But where does it define it this way? It doesn't no, define. I'm, I'm just giving you an example of how it can apply that title to Yeshua. Yeah, but we can here. Joe's witness is telling me it means he's the first one and the last one directly resurrected by the Father. So you can make it say anything, but that's not what it says there. It applies the titles in the same sense that it was applied to God Almighty in the previous chapter. Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, first and last. Well, for example, the title Mashiach is applied to Cyrus as well as, as, well as Yeshua. And yet, Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, first and last, is only applied to the true God. Specifically, first and last, only applied to Job in the Old Testament and to no creature. Mashiach means anointed. That's a generic term. Just like a prophet, many prophets, many kings. But in the Old Testament, only one and one alone is the first and last, Jehovah, and it's never given to a creature. Isaiah 44, verse 6, and Isaiah 48, verse 12. So there are some titles you can't give to a creature. They're only true of God. So that's why I'm a Trinitarian. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll check out the link and look into this a little more. Yeah, and Lord willing, in the near future, I want to talk again. I'm here. They'll contact me. So thank you for your willingness to participate. I enjoyed this conversation with you.